Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our webinar today. I'm uh, Thomas von Larcher, I'm Managing Editor of the uh, journal SN Applied Sciences and I had to run the meeting today. Today we have uh, Professor Irfan uh, Khan from Texas A&M University with us. And I would like uh, to introduce Professor Khan. Professor Khan started uh, his scientific career with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, received from University of Engineering and Technology, Lahore, Pakistan in 2009. And he received two Master of Science degrees. The first one in 2011 in Electrical Power Engineering, from the University of Greenwich in the United Kingdom. The second one in 2017 in electrical and computer engineering from Carnegie Mellon University in the United States. In 2018, Professor Khan received a PhD in electrical and computer engineering, again from Carnegie Mellon University. So today, Professor Khan is assistant professor at the Department of Marine Engineering Technology with a joint appointment with the Electrical and Computer Engineering at Texas A&M College, College Station. He is director of the Clean and Resilient Energy Systems Lab, abbreviated CARES. Last but not least, I should not forget to mention Professor Khan is with our journal and um, recently joined our editorial board, engineering, in the engineering section. So um, coming back to our uh, webinar today, we will have time for questions after the talk. So please type your question into the chat box as we go, or after the talk, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. So with this, um, Welcome again, Irfan. We are, we are very delighted to have you in our webinar series today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research and also introducing me. And thank you, everybody uh, from different parts of the world. It, it might be too late for you, but thank you very much for joining today. And it's, it's great to have all of you here. So without wasting more time in, <laughs> on uh, general discussion, let's uh, start our today's uh, presentation. Uh, so I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you, can you see my screen? Uh, not now. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we, we so, can see your screen. Maybe you can uh, switch to the presenter mode. Yes, that would be better. Yes, great, perfect. Okay, so yeah, so today's talk is on HVDC transmission technologies for offshore wind power plants, and we are talking from power electronics perspective from Power Electronics Solutions. So, my name is Dr. Ifan Khan, and this is my email address. Uh, this is name of my lab, CARES Lab, Clean and Resilient Energy System. This is link for CARES Lab. And uh, I'm also editor uh, with uh, SN, Springer Nature Applied Science Journal. So, and my affiliation is Texas a and University. So if we talk about the content of presentation, we are going to talk about introduction and then wind generators different kind of wind generator transmission options of offshore wind turbine generation. And then we're going to talk about offshore wind power plants configurations, uh, grid requirements, uh, converter topologies we have, and then finally opportunities and solution and conclusion. So let's start introduction. Uh, so fuel consumption is basically consumed for electrical, electrical electricity generation and transportation. And this should be reduced to zero till 2050. And so available options are, uh, from available options, solar and wind is the most viable options. 
we also have battery integration which can take care of the intermittency and filtering of these uh, re renewable sources intermittent which are in intermittent so if we talk about onshore and offshore wind turbine generation share we can see this is the the first one is onshore and offshore jointly and total share was 1.7 in 2010 which has raised to 6% in 2018 19 expected to reach 21% and then 35% in 2050 if we talk about onshore onshore we have a bigger share than offshore 178 gigawatt in 2010 and 2018 542 and we expect to reach 5044 gigawatt in 2050 However, on offshore side, we have three gigawatt in 2010, 23 uh, gigawatt in 2018, and we also expect to reach 1,000 gigawatt in 2015. So today we are talking about uh, offshore wind turbine option, which is actually 50 to 200 kilometer from the shore, depending on power rating and transmission mode we are using. So this is offshore onshore wind installation in 2018 in the world so in north america uh, we have 108 gigawatt and in europe so if we see in asia we have a big a portion of offshore onshore wind generation in asia 2646 expected in 2050 so if we talk about onshore one uh, in onshore offshore one offshore wind uh, installed capacity we do not have any in north america so far all we have is onshore one but we do have uh, in europe in asia uh, asia is actually excelling in offshore wind turbine and also onshore wind turbine although offshore wind turbine is currently not very popular in the american continent but it is supposed to grow uh, especially uh, recently our government introduced a lot of funds for offshore wind turbines so these are the milestone our wind industry achieved uh, if we start 19 started from 1982 first three blade wind turbine model was created and then 1991 first offshore wind uh, from in Denmark was erected and then uh, in 2001 uh, wind energy association was formed and then similarly 2008 uh, 5 14 and 16 we have wind power provided four percent of global electricity in 17 first floating offshore wind farm was built in Scotland in 2018 our capacity reached 564 gigawatt. And so you see it's growing fast. It's rapid growth. And 2019, we have 10 megawatt commercially available offshore wind turbine. Commercially, you can go and purchase. So these are the milestones. So if we just uh, differentiate between onshore and offshore, let's first talk about onshore. Benefit of onshore is this is a mature technology. Installation and maintenance cost is less it's more economical than offshore one and it could boost the local economy we could have job opportunities and all those things onshore one has some problems speed is not is highly variable it's not smooth and turbine efficiency is low due to operation at lower speed so efficiency is less because speed is less and per unit power generation is lesser compared to offshore one on the other way, if we talk about offshore one, offshore has benefits, it's located deep into ocean where we have strong and reliable winds. It does not affect human life or bird life. Also, it has higher per unit power generation, but it has some shortcomings. Main is its cost. It has higher installation, transmission, and maintenance costs. Wear and tear on wind turbine is also higher. And as maintenance, we have to go deep in the ocean to maintain our wind turbine downtime is high because of this uh, issue because it's, it's it's in the middle of ocean and expensive cost of the mission due to these reasons so although it's more efficient but it's more expensive after wind turbine so let's talk about different wind generators so we have all these different kind of wind generators we have square care induction generator we have a wound rotor induction double fed induction generator permanent magnet synchronous generator one order synchronous generator. So all these wind generators are there. We also have a gearbox. So wind generator converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. Gearbox is used to keep our 
uh, generator speed into amplitude region. What is amplitude region? So this is our amplitude region. So for different speeds, for different speeds, we have this red point, which is the maximum power point tracking point. We have to keep rotating our rotor at this point. So our gearbox try to maintain this amplitude speed. So if we talk about power generated from wind generator is processed and controlled by this power electronics converter. So in between the transmission line and generation and generator, we have this power electronics converter. We will talk about all these different options. So our first option is uh, we will use a square scale induction generator. If we use square scale induction generator, we have speed variation only 1%. And gearbox is used to keep operation within the amplitude region. So this gearbox. And what does this uh, transformer and soft starter does? So transformer step up our voltage to match with the uh, transmission side. And soft starter is used in the starting. It will bypass after startup process. In higher power requirement, 50, 60 hertz operation is achieved with four to six poles of square scale induction generator. It draws reactive power from utility grid. So to compensate that, we have react uh, uh, capacitor banks here in parallel, connected in parallel, so that we could take our reactive power from this capacitor bank. So it has uh, it is a simpler a simpler design. It has low cost and reliable operation, but efficiency is low because we have only one percent of speed variation allowable. So lower operating efficiency variation in wind power generation is pass on to the grid if there is because we do not have speed control on this generator our second option is we use wound rotor induction generator so in the wound rotor we have 10 percent speed variation allowable it's semi-variable speed and again gearbox we use gearbox it is better it is more efficiency than the previous version but still we have uh, i mean it's improved efficiency than the previous version and it's reliable operation but when we talk about this advantage, we still have only 10% control on the speed and low energy conversion efficiency as compared to existing topology, which are much better. We are controlling this speed 10% using this variable resistor, power electronics variable resistor. So we are losing some energy in this one. So actually, that's why efficiency is less. And next one is DFID, double fed induction generator. In doubly generation generator, we have 30% speed variation control. Again, we use gearbox, so 30% uh, because 30% speed control is there. So our road, our power electronics converter, which is in the middle, is also rated for 30% uh, rated power of, of the full power, 30% rated. So power electronics converter use here is bidirectional in nature because we can also feed the grid and also we can take power back in case of some uh, reactive power control or if, if there's some issue so advantages are it has extended speed range 30 percent speed range improved dynamic performance and robust performance but still it has limited speed range limited fault ride to capability and slip rings are there brushes are there which requires maintenance almost every six to twelve months we have to maintain them or replace them and still low energy efficiency because we have only control up at 30% speed. Next is our fourth option is we can use full capacity using power electronics converter. So we can use any of these uh, generation generator, square root cage, uh, permanent magnet, or wound rotor sequence generator. So we have 100% speed control and we use, uh, we use for that power electronics converter here is used and that's rated for 100 percent power electronics uh, speed control and, and the rating of power electronics converter is 100 percent of the capacity of total power rating so it can achieve reactive power compensation smooth smooth grid integration it also helps in achieving operational high operation efficiency so advantages, it has full power control, improved fault tolerance, all the problems which we had with the previous version, we have all advantages here. But what is the disadvantage? Advantages, disadvantages is that we have high switching losses because we are using high frequency. So we have high, higher switching losses. We have higher size because of this power electronics converter and cost is high because of this power electronics converter and complexity of control and of the overall system because of this power electronics converter in 
in between. Okay, so what, which option, transmission line option is better? We have AC, we have DC transmission. So which one is better? So if we, before talking about this transmission, what is the architecture of wind turbine? How we connect with the onshore grid? So in the start, we have wind turbine, which generates medium voltage AC power. Then we have our, uh, trans it is transfer transformed to higher AC power at the substation. We have substation over here. And from there, we have a HVAC platform, which convert alternating in a current power into DC using for direct uh, transmission to the on onshore grid. And then this we have, HVDC under undersea cable. A range is more than 100 kilometers. And finally, we have converter station with this onshore grid, which convert our power back to AC and step up. So to regular uh, to match with the onshore grid. So let's talk about all both different options. So uh, so offshore wind turbine is actually we have uh, each turbine is connected to local collector. So we have this local collector, this local bus, we rectify it and then invert it and then step up with the help of transformer. And we, so each of these wind turbine is, has its own inverter, rectifier and transformer. We have offshore station from offshore station. We step up AC voltage and then transmit to on, on sugar through AC line. So this is for AC. Uh, so output voltage is uh, 0.69 to 3 kV of this wind turbine, and this voltage is step up to 33 for local transmission up till here. So and so we use either HVDC or HVAC transmission technique when we are transmitting to long distance transmission. So let's talk about HVAC. So if we talk about HVAC, it's simple, mature technology, both offshore and onshore, both. Are, uh, have high power step up transformer without any power converter. We do not have power converter technology. Unsure transformer steps up voltage from 33 to 60 to 40 kV depending on transmission distance. This uh, step up in voltage helps in reducing losses and reducing cost. Its simple design operation and easy protection system is already well matured for AC transmission, but we do have some disadvantages. Okay, drawbacks are this overhead transmission lines and underground cables that have dominating inductive and capacitive effects, due to which we have a limit of power we can transmit. So active power transmission capability decreases as transmission distance increases. Due to this reason, there is, there is a break even distance, like from 60 to 100 kilometers, we do prefer AC, HVAC. But for higher than that, for bigger distances, we may have to go for HVDC. And also subharmonic res resonance may occur due to these all uh, reactive components inside transmission line and also transformer. So an onshore and offshore grid must be synchronized because both are AC with each other, which stress the offshore wind generation system for frequency and active power regulation. So if we talk about HVDC, in HVDC, we have offshore station. Uh, that offshore station convert our AC into DC. Mm -hmm. And then we have this underground HVDC cable, which transmits our power to onshore station, which converts back to AC. So we have a rectifier station and inverter station on both sides. So HVDC transmission consists of converter on both sides. Each converter station consists of high power transformer and power electronics. Offshore side converter rectifies using, we have different kinds of uh, converters, LLC, LCC, line communicated converter, IGBT based voltage source converter and multi-level modular converter. So we're different types. We will talk about these three different types today. So HVDC cables are used in between offshore and onshore station We have HVDC cables. These are used for transmitting. So what are the benefits and uh, drawbacks of HVDC? So we have more benefits. Absence of reactants because it's DC, so we can utilize full, uh, full current capability of the underground cables. Theoretically, there is no limit of power transfer. No underlying resonance effect resonance frequency because dc 
losses occurring in DC are, are lesser than AC. HVDC cables are also lighter and making installation cheap and easier. HVDC cables installed with fewer cable joints and synchronous operation is also not required because we have DC transmission. However, we have few drawbacks. So drawbacks are converter employed in onshore and offshore station forms major cost. It's, a, it's expensive. And if we use thyristor based LCC line commuter converter, then we have well, we do have communication commutation failure. But if we do not use thyristor based, then we're good. We can use IGBT based. And fault detection and mitigation techniques also require uh, protection equipment. DC protection equipment is not that mature enough. So these are two drawbacks of uh, HVDC: cost, uh, protection equipment maturity, and also if we're using a thyristor based uh, converter, then it's a problem. Okay. So types of power electronics configuration which we have. So we have different options for power electronics. So number one configuration is we have parallel three, uh, three all these wind turbines are parallel connected. Transmission line is HVAC. We have only transformer to step up voltage. So wind turbine is connecting back to back. Step up transformer is used to step up voltage, thus minimizing losses. And finally, collected power is further step up at the end to match with the onshore grid. And due to reactive component transmission cable, a reactive power compensation requirement increases with length. So we have minimum hardware. We do not have power electronics converter, but we have different problems. And problems are limited power transfer due to reactive power compensation. Our second configuration is that we have collector system again parallel, a transmission is HVDC. Now we have our transformer plus our converter. So we are adding converter here and transmission line is also HVDC. So wind turbine again, back to back converter, AC collector system, 33 kV voltage over here, this collector system. And then we can further step up this voltage. Uh, reactive. So we do not have a reactive power composition because it's HVDC. And converter station now consists of a transformer and a, a rectifier. Inverter station has a transformer and inverter. This is uh, most popular in present time. It has uh, HVDC, uh, it has a benefit of high power capability, but it has power electronics components, so which is complex. And offshore wind turbine has larger footprint and cost because power electronics is more there. Our third configuration is we on the uh, collectors on the collector side we have mesh. This is a mesh system uh, from the collector side. But other thing other than that everything is same like previous configuration. Configuration four we have multi terminal uh, transmission. So if you see transmission we have multi terminal HVDC. So this has been used to improve reliability. Other than that it's HVDC. And, but we have multi-terminal. If some terminal goes bad, it, it broke down, we can use other terminals. So to improve reliability. Configuration five, we have, we do not have transformer in this case on primary side, we have converter, DC to DC converter. So we are generating our input voltage at 1.2 volt, but we are stepping up using this DC to DC converter. So uh, converter session is only converter now, no transformer. Uh, so DC DC converter are used use medium voltage, uh, medium frequency transform MFT to boost voltage to 30 kV, uh, 30 to 50 kV DC level. Uh, so converter station footprint is smaller because we are using high frequency transformer and medium frequency transformer is using DC DC converter. But again, it's expensive, it's complex higher level of insulation for wind turbine and converter station because over here we have higher voltage. So that's why we have a higher insulation level requirement. Our configuration six is we use series in our turbine we use in series. So HVDC again, but we are collector system is series. So rectifier system converts AC power into DC. Modules are connected in series. So if we want to have 300 kV, we can connect all those 60 modules in series. So uh, wind turbine of each module is 50 megawatts. So we can uh, achieve rating of our rating of each module would increase there by reducing number of series connected modules. So now rating of each turbine is increased. It's 15 megawatts. So our number of turbines will be less in series. 
so we have advantages that we have minimum hardware requirement for series connection FVDC. We do not need individual converter inverter for turbine, but we have some problem that if each if single module fails, we will have loss of power and voltage. So we have to bypass that module. Failure of multiple modules will lead to permanent disruption of power. So this is drawback, less reliability. Moving on, let's talk about grid requirement. What are the grid requirement by IEEE or other uh, standards? So number one is grid voltage. On y-axis we have grid volt uh, reactive power, and on x-axis we have grid voltage. So from 0.9 to 1.1, we do not need to transmit or absorb any reactive power. But if we go from here, if we go to higher power, if we are our uh, higher voltage, sorry high voltage, if we have from 1.1, 1 .1, uh, from 1.02 to 1.1 over this ring, we have to linearize, increase reactive power uh, uh, absorption. So our wind turbine has to absorb reactive power linearly. On the other side, if our voltage goes back from uh, 0.98 all the way 0.9, we have to linearly uh, inject reactive power to the uh, grid if our voltage goes uh, down. So this is a requirement when voltage sag occurs, we have to inject, uh, if voltage sag occurs, we have to inject power. And on the other side, if voltage swells, if voltage increases, we have to absorb power. Other standard, which is active power and reactive power, so on y-axis, we have reactive power. On axis, we have active power. So between 0.5, minus 0.5, and plus 0.5, we do not need to inject or absorb power. But if our uh, active power goes beyond that, if our active power is less than, uh, is more than 0 0.8, 0 0.5, then we need to absorb active uh, reactive power. Uh, if we're injecting active power from more than 0 0.5 to the grid, then we have to absorb reactive power. On the other side, if our active power uh, active power transmission to on to the on grid is less than 0.5, then we need to absorb reactive power. So this is uh, uh, this is standard for active and reactive power. Moving on, we have another standard for frequency and point versus point of common coupling. So this regulation is for Denmark. This regulation for China, and then this is third one is IEEE regulation. So in Denmark, between 49 and 50 hertz, we do not need to do this is normal operation. If we have a frequency lower than that, if we have frequency between 47 and 49, normal operation up to 30 minutes. But after that, we need to stop injection. And below 45.47.5, only we need to wait 30 seconds, and then we can stop operation. In China, uh, we have similar kind of regulation between 49.5 to 50.5 is normal operation. But other than that, we have not, not normal operation. IEEE standard says that normal operation we have only between 0.88 and 1.1 volt. This is normal operation and frequency 59.3 and 60.5. Beyond that, if we have frequency more than 65, 60.5 or less than 59.3, then we have to disconnect within six cycles. And if voltage goes up and down, we have to disconnect for different with different within different cycles, 120 cycle, two cycles. As voltage level is more advanced, we have to be take faster operation. Of disconnection. All right, and then we have file drive through capability. File drive through capability mean if our on grid station is uh, is under fault, if it stop operating, we we need to stop our operation. And when it's go, when it comes back on grid station, then we have to uh, reconnect. So it says that uh, on shore grid station voltage goes to zero, then a renewable source should be uh, remain connected for 150 milliseconds. So if you see here, if this goes to zero, our voltage goes to zero, still we should keep connected by 150 milliseconds. And after that, we should disconnect. Furthermore, if our voltage goes back to 0.9 to zero, 
then we need to uh, disconnect from 1.5 second to 0.5 second. So this is a linear operation. From 0.9 to 0 volt, then we need to linearly disconnect based on what voltage we have. If we have zero voltage, we need to disconnect 0.1 second. And this pur the purpose is to support onshore transmission system during low voltage duration. Thus, during this time, offshore wind generation starts pumping reactive power into the grid. Apart from this, a uh, system must operate between 0.9 and 1. This is normal operation. And lastly, we have black start capability. So once our grid goes to black start, in case of fault, uh, offshore wind turbine must be stopped. And however, an onshore grid back, is back online, offshore must be reconnected automatically. Uh, in case in HVDC structure, onshore and offshore grids are AC, so they're isolated. So if we are using uh, a thyristor based uh, LCC converter, then it's not, it cannot be used in offshore generation because it, uh, we have to commutate and we, it's hard to reconnect. So that's why we do not prefer thyristor based LCC converters. All right, so we will now talk about converter topologies. What type of converter topologies we have? So our, we have uh, four converter topologies. One is our conventional HVDC transmission, trans, uh, transmission system is transforming a large amount of power from for long distances. And back-to-back -back converter station, both converters in the same building. Our second option is, uh, so to, to use this HVDC, we have three different options. One option is that we use HVDC system with the highest power and voltage rating. And we know that thyristor is used for high power and voltage rating. So we have 12 kV, 6 point kilo ampere ABB converter, which is thyristor based line commutated converter. Its advantage is it's a robust technology. Its power rating is high. We can operate at line frequency. When we operate at line frequency, we have lesser losses. And, but we have disadvantages because it's thyristor based. We are using line frequency. So its control is poor. And also we do, we do not have independent control of active and reactive power because of commutation problem of thyristor. So then second option is we can use IGBT. If we use IGBT level, then we have two options, two level VSC, voltage source converter. So this becomes most preferable uh, technology for medium power because IGBT we cannot use for high power and high voltage. So for medium power application, we can use IGBT due to its fast operation and independent PQ control. We do not have any computation, commutation problem. So the rating is 4.5, 1.2 kilo ampere, which is way below this uh, thyristor based converter topology, but still it has a faster control and it's more reliable. Uh, uh, it's controllable, PQ is controllable. So we have disadvantages because we are operating at high frequency so we have high frequency losses compared to thyristor because thyristor was we were using at line frequency 60 hertz 50 hertz so more devices must be placed in series to achieve the same power to achieve the same power we need to connect many switches in series and parallel for connecting the for achieving the required power and voltage our third option is we use igbt but let's use modular multi-level converter mmc so for that, this has become the most preferred technology. Although we do not have a real application for this one, but this is a, a very high performing technology in research. Due to multi-level operation and moderate switching losses, because frequency is line frequency, and so we have less losses. So, but control, we have some issues. Control methodology is complex due to we have complex uh, capacitor balancing issues and also second harmonic uh, problem in this uh, MMC. So let's talk about individually for all of these three. LCC, if we talk about LCC, this is the technology we use. On the offshore side, we have 12 pulse rectifier and a reactive power management system on the off onshore side, we also have rectifier power management and 12 plus inverter. So this is rectifier and this is inverter. In between transmission line, we also have DC line filters, which we use. 
So this is LCC, and in real, if we're talking about 12 pass rectifier, then we have uh, this is 12 pass rectifier using thyristors. 12 pass rectifier is used for minimizing input side harmonics using zero degree uh, angle, zero degree, and 30 degree for all of these three transformers. So uh, this primary transformer, secondary transformer, and this delta secondary transformer has 30 degree phase shift between primary and secondary. And this is our reactive power management. We use capacitors and inductors to compensate for reactive power because in thyristor based control, we need to have reactive power compensation. So this is technology which we use on onshore side, onshore, offshore grid, and then we have 12 pulse rectifier. We have filter at this line. Again, at the end, we have filter. We have inverter and off onshore grid. We connected with the onshore grid. So this uh, 12 pulse rectifier uh, deal with all these feature frequency control, frequency stabilization, power control, AC voltage frame reference, tape changes control, and onshore inverter deal with DC current controller, DC voltage controller, AC voltage, minimum extension angle control. So this is for LCC. If we talk about VSC, voltage source inverter, which is IGBT based. So in this case, we are using switches IGBT. So voltage source, con uh, voltage, uh, source converter VSC consists of PWM control IGBT two level VS, uh, VSC, two level VSC for achieving desired power in, inside these switches, inside these switches we need to make a wall, IGBT wall to connect several switches in series in parallel so that we could have the required rating, power rating which was easily achievable in the thyristor based converter. So similarly, we need to also connect diodes across switches. So IGBTs are self commutation devices, so we do not need to give a signal to turn off the switch. So this is good thing. This is improvement over the which was which are typically latching devices and depend on external uh, now we are operating at switching frequency is increased and chances of commutation failure is also zero because we are not doing commutation anymore externally however we have some problem if because we are doing at high frequency so we have high frequency losses switching losses so switching losses so efficiency is a little bit less due to switching losses due to pwm operation now dominating components are fundamental frequency and this the uh, and also, uh, this drastically de decreases size of reactive uh, elements like capacitor inductor because of this high frequency operation. So on both sides of converter station. Additionally, faster dynamics and dependent PQ control can be achieved using this PWM control. So if we talk about the circuit diagram which we have for VSC voltage source converter, we have active power, active and reactive power control. So we use vector control technique, P P2 control. So since AC signals are transformed into DC technology, and then we also need PLL over here uh, to coordinate reference frame generation. Uh, so in, in conventional three phase system, D2 axes are used, which are perpendicular to each other. This means that E three phase quantity is now transferred into DC quantities. Uh, D and Q. So DQ, uh, D control is used for reactive power or voltage control and uh, sorry, Q control. D control is used for frequency stabilization and DC voltage control and DC power. So this is D control, which is used for voltage control, uh, grid voltage control and uh, uh, D control over here is used for uh, voltage stabilization and frequency control. So to avoid shortening of IGBT wall, that time we, we need to apply that time. However, this time must not contribute significant distortion. So this, this is a little bit problem with VSC. So this should be, this time must be uh, judicially selected. We should wisely select this time. Let's move on to our last option, which is MMC, modular multi-level converter. In modular multi-level converter, we have, uh, we have switches in parallel with these capacitor devices. So instead of using IGBT walls, which was series parallel connection of IGBT, we are using identical cell structure to achieve superior performance at relatively lower switching losses. So we will use 
lower frequency so to achieve lower losses with the same dynamic response each cell connected in series so these all cells are connected in series uh, contributes two level operation to the output voltage waveform so an operating voltage level of 200 as high as, as 300 kV high number of cells are required this helps in achieving multi-level operation with low THD total harmonic distortion so due to this reason square wave switching is also used to achieve multi-level output operation and because we are working at fundamental frequency switching losses are less as compared to level VSC. So in NMC, it can be observed that two inductors, we have two inductors are placed on each arm. These inductors help in limiting circulating current between these uh, circuits, between all these cells. Okay, so if we talk about uh, each cell, each cell consists of a DC bus capacitor and H bridge. So we have either H bridges are half half bridge or full bridge so this is half bridge this is full bridge in parallel we have a capacitor so each cell consists of three modes of operation on state if we on it off it or block state block state means no switch and pulses are given so block mode is employed to achieve either passive charging of cell capacitance or block discharging current so in half bridge we have only two level of voltage either zero or plus vdc in full bridge cell we have three level plus voltage, plus VDC, negative VDC, and zero. Although full bridge has higher number of levels with DC linked voltage, however, it results in higher switching because we have more number of switches, so higher switching losses due to, uh, as compared to half bridge configuration. For optimal operation, uh, uh, to con in the control algorithm for circulating operation, full bridge can be controlled to operate as half bridge, thereby op optimizing the switching across to optimize switching losses we can use our full bridge uh, cell work as half bridge using optimization algorithm so concurrently nmc because it has low dv by dt ratio uh, voltage per time so in in small time we have change of voltage is small higher number of voltage level and speeder thd performance is a most preferred method nmc so, but we do have some issues with NMC, and the first one is second harmonic uh, output in the in the output current. So, existing of second uh, harmonic current uh, components as due to square switching. So, this double frequent this double frequency component would result in module voltage ripple and would lead to higher losses. How do we eliminate that? To eliminate that, we compared with zero and generate modulation reference signal. Over here, we generate modulation reference signal. And this second harmonic modulation signal requires is added to the fundamental modulation signal. This cancels the second harmonic component. We also have some other problem. We have volt, uh, capacitor voltage balancing. Over here in the capacitor balancing, optimal operation on C depends on entirely on the cell voltage balance each cell should balance voltage should have equal amount of voltage across it thus to achieve active balancing so capacitor voltages are controlled to stay equal at all instants so how do we do that n number of cells must be operating then active voltage balancing algorithm decides cell contributes to the output voltage based on arm current polarity so we change polarity to control the output uh, voltage across each cell highest and lowest capacitor voltage is ranked and available redundant states are designed for discharging and charging cell capacitors finally we have one problem which is nearest level control nearest voltage level control so over here nlc loop achieves desired ac, uh, AC voltage by comparing reference signal with the uh, predefined we have predefined uh, steel case voltage waveform. So, due to many cascaded modules, this results in high number of voltage levels, thereby resulting in low TAD. Since it's a yes or no decision, we want if we want to turn on a cell or turn off. So, it's yes or no decision for module switching. So, memory requirement is not high. Also, switching losses of the system are basically low because we are not using PWM switching. We are using square wave switching.
Okay, so, and then finally, we have some good things with MMC, but we cannot achieve high power and high voltage, uh, which was in thyristor based LLC. So there's another technology, which is hybrid configuration. We can uh, make hybrid of LC, LCC and MMC. So MMC has superior performance, but costly and results in higher losses. These concerns can be addressed by integrating LCC into MMC. So combined system would be lower losses, lower cost, and offshore size unidirectional power flow requirement upgrading existing LCC. So for these strong grids with strong onshore power flow, LLC can be preferred, whereas for V grid, we can connect to the MMC. Control algorithm will decide which if LCC or MMC should be used and what's the requirement if it's if it's weak grid or if it's strong grid. All right, so what opportunities and solutions we have uh, in HVDC uh, and of, of, uh, in offshore winter power plants. So out, these are all different opportunities and expected period of commercialization. But if we talk about only electric from electrical side, we have next generation turbines, HVDC infrastructure should be improved, DC power takeoff and array cables, increased turbine ratings, more megawatts, we have 15 megawatts, so we should increase to higher rating, reducing electrical infrastructure, wind farm level control strategies. So these are from electrical perspective. So key areas are power electron, a key area to power electronics are improved turbine design, high power rating, improved control strategies, HVDC infrastructure, reducing electrical components and improving cable configuration. So let's talk about all these uh, opportunities and solution. So our the first one is existing maximum power of commercial wind generator is 15 megawatt. So stress is on developing more than 20 megawatt generator with superior mechanical and electrical performance. So this is one future research direction. Power electronics side, from power electronics side, we have increase in wind generator power rating dictates higher, uh, high power, power electronic circuitry for achieving desired performance. So wide band gap devices, gallium nitride and silicon carbide should be used. They are commercially 6.5 and 1.2 uh, kV and 1.2 kilo ampere rating. So we can further work, uh, work on these to improve these ratings. So with semiconductor devices of high rating, switching walls or cell can be produced together, can be mined together to reduce uh, significantly when compared with the existing design. And current intensive wind generation and transmission system can be designed. So high megawatt rating power design turbine, gearless wind turbine system and improved wind, wind design. We can also, this is another uh, potential uh, work area. Furthermore, we have transformer side. So on the transformer side, we have existing Offshore wind uh, usually use low frequency transformer in both AC collector system and offshore wind uh, converter system. So AC collector side is rated for almost wind power. This transformer can be easily replaced. We should replace this with medium frequency transformer. It will decrease footprint and size. It will also improve reliability and modularity. So Medium frequency transformer consists of high frequency operated power converter configuration, which enables a high frequency transformer. And also we can achieve isolation and voltage transformer level, transformation level. So these converters are usually connected in cascaded on the input side and parallel on the output side. And parasitic inductance of uh, medium frequency transformer will influence modular structure when operated at high switching frequency. To avoid this, individual control algorithm can be applied for each module. This was for transformer. Now we can talk about advanced control, advanced grid control. So advanced grid control, if we have black start capability, low voltage ride through capability and battery uh, connected with renewable energy source integration. So for all these capacities, this methodology will address intermittency and variability issue of wind generation system with battery storage acting as a filtering unit during period of low 
power generation. Battery integration can be easily incorporated when medium frequency transformers are required. And black circuitability of power electronic circuit must be improved in accordance with the strict codes that when, once it's black, it's black start, it should automatically start back and connect with the grid. And finally, we have reliability. So offshore wind turbines really have higher installation and maintenance costs, design guidelines followed are optimized with almost no redund redundant components. Due to this failure of any major component would result in downtown, downtime and operation at reduced power. So how can we improve that? Modular design. By improving modular design and reliability of system can be improved. So improve reactive power compensation techniques consisting of configuration and employing both conventional and advanced power electronic structure can help in minimizing losses and any stress operation okay if we talk about conclusion so in this presentation we talk about present and projected trends of onshore and offshore wind generation are discussed in after that we talk about different options available for wind generators uh squirrel cage doubly fed induction generator and then wound rotor so all those wind generators along with their benefits and shortcomings then we talk about different hvac and rhvac which one is better their benefits and their drawbacks then we found that hvdc transmission is found to be more advantageous for further and deeper waters if we go further from shore then we talk about parallel connected AC collector system is found to be most popular configuration for integrating individual wind turbines on an offshore grid farm. Then we talk about different grid codes, uh, IEEE grid codes. So strict guidelines must be followed for integration of offshore power generation to the onshore grid. Active power versus frequency, PQ restriction, Fall drive through capability, black star capability must be achieved. And then we talk about different HVDC converters. Although thyristor based line commutator converters is the most reliable and used for high power and high voltage application, it is not being used in offshore transmission due to its slower dynamics and inability to black start due to commutation issues. And IGBT based voltage source converter and MMC are the most popular for medium and high power, uh, respectively. So, VSC for medium power and MMC for high power. Designing and commercialization of high rated wind turbines, efficient robot. So, these are all those suggestions and future research direction. High rated wind turbines, efficient and robust power electronic system. Accurate and self healing control algorithms, deployment of solid state transformers, medium frequency transformers, and modular design approach are identified as major improvement opportunities in offshore wind generation system. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah. Questions, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... Professor Khan for this uh, very nice overview. It was uh, indeed nice to uh, to, to uh, I really enjoyed your tour uh, through the state of the art advantages, uh, drawbacks, recent developments, challenges, and new perspectives of uh, offshore wind power plants. So um, we have time for questions. So uh, again, please, uh, if you like, please type your question into the chat box or you can now unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah, actually I went to starting from renewable energy generation. I actually combine all those things together so that it should be extensive enough to, to convey all those ideas. Uh, starting from wind generation, renewable generation, and all the way to HVDC, a different kind of wind generators, and HVDC, HVAC, which one is better, and all those things, and even future opportunities. So, if any, we have any question, please feel free to ask, unmute. Hi, Irfan. Uh, it's me, Umair from Alberg University. 
I would like to ask about the solid state transformers. Uh, how do you think it could be usable in um, in the offshore wind turbine along with the in along with our distribution sector? Is it possible in near future? And what are the challenges in them? Yeah, great question. Yeah. So SST solid state transformer is. Uh, much better than line frequency transformer due to obvious reason that its size is less. Its, its footprint is small. And because its footprint is small, for, specifically for offshore application, where we have to install our transformer inside the sea, we need big structure if we want LFT. So there are certain opportunities that we should uh, install a medium frequency transformer inside the ocean and this will improve foot size you know cost and also uh, you know the problem with mft sst is that it has uh, because we are operating at high frequency so it has some losses but then we have different control algorithms which can improve those losses so this is one challenge other challenge with solid state transformer is its cost uh, we are the technology still is not mature uh, we researchers are working on it and currently we do not have uh, commercially available high power solid state transformers which we could use in the uh, uh, offshore wind turbine application so due to immature technology cost is high but i believe that maybe in next five to 10 years, uh, because of so much research is going on, it will be more mature and the cost will drastically go down. So there is potential that uh, maybe in five to 10 years, the, the newer wind turbine would have MFT and solid state transformers. Did I ask, answer your question? Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Matt, for your question.